15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Space Nuts podcast with me, Andrew Dunkley, your host and astronomer at large, the titanium man himself, Fred Watson. Uh, Hello, hi, Fred. Andrew. Maybe you better explain why I'm the titanium man. <laughs> because last week after we recorded, you went straight into hospital and exactly. got a new knee. <laughs> Yeah, the knee was very definitely a dicky knee. This one's good. Um, it's uh, the new knee, uh, oh, sorry, what's called a TKR, a total knee replacement, is one of the biggest bits of orthopaedic surgery you can have. So um, recovery time of order a year, so I'm a week into it, uh, but it's good. Wow. <laughs> well, we're very pleased that uh, through your pain, uh, you have been able to join us. I, I appreciate that. And so does everyone else, but better than lying around in bed. Actually, they don't let you do that anymore, do they? They, they get you up and about. I was walking fast. the um, six hours after the surgery. Yeah. On, on, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've heard that if you don't do that, it can all go belly up. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, all about, about movement. Exactly. Yeah, Physiotherapy, and... movement. And I can actually walk now a week out. I can walk without crutches. Um, which is astonishing, really. But uh, I'm, I'm going to keep the crutches for another day or so, just because uh, it's less painful. <laughs> In fact, his recovery has been so impressive. He got a phone call from Arsenal just uh, yesterday. In your dream. Um, was no. it goalkeeper? No, it was or goalkeeper. Left post. right out. <laughs> My favourite position. Goalpost. <laughs> That would work. Now, um, all jokes aside, a bit of sad news too. For yes. Um, yeah. Uh, we, 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 our, our furry friend, Mandu, uh, who joins us uh, very occasionally on Space Nuts. Yes, uh, he reached the news. end of the road uh, this week. Um, very sadly, he's not been very well. He was an elderly cat. Uh, we're not sure exactly how old he was. We, we've had him for 12 years or so. We think he was about three when we got him. 15 years old is a good age for a cat. He's had some internal problems which got compounded uh, really towards the end of last week. And uh, yeah, we had a fairly uh, a fairly um, upsetting weekend with him. And um, uh, as, as you know, we actually live next door to, to an animal hospital, to a vet's surgery. And we know all the vets and the vets all know Mandu because he used to be their triage nurse. Uh, so um, they were upset as well, but uh, end of the road. And it was it was a very peaceful and, um, you know, a, 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 a very fitting conclusion to what has been an, an extraordinary life. Mandu is he's just, you know, he's, he's basically dominated the, the life around home here. He's such a big cat, um, getting on for 10 kilograms at one point. Uh, and that's, you know, the size of a small child. Uh, so his presence was always felt. He was always cheerful, always very, very affectionate and friendly and, and much missed. Um, so the Cosmic Cat, uh, somebody uh, texted after I, I sorry, uh, tweeted after I tweeted the news that we'd lost him, that um, he'd gone to join Comet Neo, Neowise, which is currently gracing our skies, which was a nice thought. Indeed. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that, Fred, as a person who grew up with cats and had uh, have had several over the years. I know how it feels. Uh, when we lost our last cat, we decided that was it. We just we just didn't want to go through it again. But you can just bond with creatures, and it's I suppose it's one of the amazing things about life is how we all bond to each other, whether we're human yeah. or otherwise. And it, uh, it can, and it hurts as much as uh, as anything can. And uh, you know, I feel. I feel sad for you, and um, I'm sure many people do, but uh, you'll have great well, memories right. uh, of, of Mandu, as we do. I, I used to love the way he interrupted us, and, <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and it was just, yeah. just part of the so show. My, mm. uh, sorry, while we're speaking... Mandy, my partner, sorry, she, um, Mandu was very much her cat, uh, and he, the, there was a, re a really amazing bond between them. It, you know, I think he, he just thought Mandy was his mum, basically, Um so that's, yeah. yes, so there's a big hole left in our life, but that's the way things are. And thank you for your condolences, Andrew. 
Now, uh, I would like to also say hi to Hannah, uh, one of our uh, regular listeners and regular contributors. Um, uh, when she's not flying around the world in a jet airliner, she's uh, she's at home in England and uh, sent us uh, some uh, or did an Instagram post of some photos uh, I assume she took from al- altitude recently uh, of uh, noctilucent clouds. But the other day she um, sent one um, and, and noted me in her post, which I appreciate, Hannah, of uh, of the comet we just um, uh, mentioned near wise. Uh, it, it, uh, she got a nice shot of it from uh, way up there. Uh, people in the northern hemisphere are starting to um, to, to really notice this thing, and it's going to become more apparent soon, yes. I believe. Yeah. It's uh, we've got another couple of weeks, maybe, in which it might be quite still quite bright. Mm, wonderful! Thanks for the photos, Hannah. They were terrific, as always. Now, Fred, we've got a few things to discuss. We haven't even got down to business yet. Uh, astronomers have discovered a cosmic structure almost 1.4 billion light years across. That is one big Lego set. Uh, also, the truth about our sister planet Venus, it's not our sister um, or something else, perhaps. Uh, we've also got some questions, audio questions today about the chemical elements. Where did they come from? And Simon in Newcastle is asking about interferometry. So we will uh, investigate all of those things on episode 211 of the Space Nuts podcast. Uh, Fred, let's start off with this uh, this cosmic structure that's been discovered. It's a massive thing, 1.4 billion years, light years across. Uh, what, what What is it? Um, I've, I've read a couple of descriptions, but I'm still trying to figure out what they've found. So um, w- when we look uh, deep into space beyond our own galaxy and, in fact, beyond our local group of galaxies, Um, we can chart the distribution of galaxies. And we find clusters of galaxies, which you and I have talked about a lot, very well known. But there's also this uh, almost like a honeycomb structure, a three-dimensional honeycomb structure in the universe, which we think was laid down uh, by the the dark matter web uh, that that really formed after the Big Bang. Um, so galaxies have formed along the, you know, along the tendrils of this web, um, and we've got uh, this, as I said, a kind of honeycomb structure. Now, over the last 20 years or so, we've been able to explore that in detail uh, by looking at the uh, details of galaxies. Uh, and this, this all comes about with things known as redshift surveys. Uh, and at the what was then the Anglo Australian Observatory, we were uh, among the first to produce a very detailed redshift survey of our local neighbourhood out actually to about two billion light years. Um, so what you do is you measure the the amount of, of redshift in a galaxy's light, and that's the of course, as the, the name implies, when you look at its spectrum, the light is shifted to the red by measuring how much it shifted. You you know its velocity, uh, and by the Hubble law, uh, if you know its velocity because of the expansion of the universe, you also know its distance effectively. So the early redshift surveys, including the what was called the 2DF uh, Galaxy Redshift Survey done by the Anglo-Australian Telescope, uh, that uh, those early surveys showed this quite clear structure within the universe. And uh, so not only are you seeing an overall honeycomb pattern, but we could also see, you know, particular features in that structure. So there there are walls of galaxies, which are, um, you know, here and there. There are some very nice animations. We, with the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope in the early 2000s, did a a redshift survey, very like the 2DF one. 2DF was an instrument on the Anglo-Australian Telescope. Um, Ours was a bit more local because it was a smaller telescope, but it covered the whole southern sky. Um, And the UK Schmidt uh, galaxy redshift, uh, sorry, galaxy survey uh, also showed these kind of phenomena, these these walls of, of galaxies. Uh, what I was about to say was, and the reason why I mentioned that, is there's a very nice fly-through of that survey, uh, the 60F galaxy survey. If you look up 60F GS on your search engine, um, it will take you to the fly-through beautifully done. Uh, so this is a simulation of what it will be like to fly through the universe at about, um, I think, a trillion times the speed of light or something. But you do get... 
You yeah, you to. get this impression of walls of galaxies coming towards you as you fly through them. So that's what this story is about. It is a newly discovered uh, wall that has been revealed by new th three-dimensional maps of the universe. Um, very big, 1.4 billion light years across. And it's being called the South Pole Wall because it is actually... Uh, close to the south pole of the sky. Now, by the south pole of the sky, what we mean is the point, uh, essentially the extension of the Earth's axis out into space in the southerly direction. The north pole of the sky is the other way, of course. Mm. Um, and how does that relate then to the, to the uh, orientation of our Milky Way? Well, the Milky Way galaxy is kind of it's probably the other way around. We should say that the solar system is tilted almost perpendicular to the Milky Way galaxy. Not quite, but almost perpendicular. And if you think about it, that means that the south pole of the sky is very near the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. And so what, what you have um, there is a, a blockage of our view um, into intergalactic space. Uh, so the, the, the south pole of the sky is not the best place to look to find walls of galaxies because our own Milky Way galaxy is in the way. We're in the plane of the galaxy. Uh, and so um, the scientists who've done this work, uh, uh, it's really quite an extraordinary piece of work. It's um, one, of the, um, one of the authors is based at, uh, in France, actually, in Paris. Uh, so it's, a, a, once again, a, a, a large group of, of scientists. Um, many of them are in the, in the, in the, the USA. Um, it's, it, it's been found not just by doing these redshift surveys, in other words, by surveying where galaxies lie in what you might call Hubble space. But they have also um, looked at the, at the velocities um, of, of galaxies in the vicinity uh, to infer the concentration of mass that you find uh, in the, uh, you know, that you, you can't see because you're in what's called the zone of galactic obs obscuration. You're, you're behind the Milky Way. So they've looked at um, things that we call peculiar velocities, and, and that's one reason why I mentioned the 60F Galaxy Survey earlier, because that was one of the first big surveys that actually used this technique. Um, and I'm, I'm getting deep into the detail here, um, Andrew, but what happens is um, if you imagine the expansion of the universe, that's carrying galaxies along, and we can measure the, the speed of the galaxy, which uh, is due to the expansion of the universe, and that gives us the distance. But uh, there, each galaxy has its own, what we call a peculiar velocity. It's, it's a velocity in addition to the Hubble flow. And the way to imagine it is if you think of a river flowing uh, and imagine a lot of boats on the river, uh, they're all being carried along by the river, but each boat's got its own individual motion within the river. Oh, okay. but that's how the galaxies, that's, that, that's what the peculiar motions of galaxies are. They're being carried along by the Hubble flow, but you're seeing uh, their peculiar motion. And so what these scientists have done is used that, look, looked at galaxies that you can see, which aren't blocked by the, uh, by the, the, by the Milky Way, and infer from their motion what gravitational structures are pulling them uh, out of, uh, you know, away from the normal Hubble flow. So it is really quite remarkable. It's a technique that has been used before. Um, the, 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 most, um, um, the, the most famous uh, evidence of that goes back 30 years, actually, something called the Great Attractor, which is once again a, a gravitational source um, behind the Milky Way when it was discovered by the peculiar motions of galaxies. So um, one, mm. just one final comment on this. This South Pole wall uh, is uh, it's probably about the fifth or sixth largest cosmic structure discovered. So... Um, yeah, yeah, I was going to bring that up. It's not the biggest one found. In fact, yeah, you, uh, as you say, it's the sixth largest. So uh, there's the some big, big stuff. stuff that's out right, there. And, and that kind of 
And and you can put it into perspective by doing a bit of mathematics. And I, I want people to do this, like we used to call it mental arithmetic at school, where you did the answer in your head. So one light year is roughly six trillion miles or nine million kilometres. And this new South Pole wall is 1.4 billion light years across. So quick, quick answer. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> nobody, nobody. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> this is why we don't measure these things in kilometres normally, Andrew. Uh, we, we stick to <laughs> No, I mean, this yeah. is massive. It's so just to massive. give you but an it, insight um, into that, that when we were doing the galaxy redshift surveys back in the early 2000s and found this kind of honeycomb structure, typically the cells of the honeycomb are about 100 million light years across, that sort of size. This thing is 14 times bigger than that, so it is a very, very big structure. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh, just, it, it just, it, it's just hard to get your head around the enormity of things within the universe, let alone the universe it's, it, itself. It's just, uh, it's just an incredible um, situation that we we are learning about bit by bit, small bits. But uh, yeah, we've we've got a big chunk of it there. But uh, again, in terms of the size of the universe, this thing's probably tiny. It's just the the nature of the universe, yeah. I suppose. Um, it, it's a big, it, it's a big place, yes. as Douglas <laughs> Douglas Adams said. Space is big. <laughs> I think he sized it up That's right. perfectly. Yes. And the answer to that question of, uh, you know, six trillion times 1.4 billion light years is, of course, 42. Uh, you're, listening, you're listening to the Space Nuts podcast with Andrew Dunkley and, of course, Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Hello again to all our social media followers, the uh, many thousands of you that follow us on Facebook, whether it's the official Space Nuts Facebook page or the Facebook podcast group that Space Nuts users put together. Uh, I notice uh, more and more people joining that group every week, which is fantastic. Gives you a chance to talk to each other about what you're doing. Just uh, if you want to join that group, you do a search for the Space Nuts podcast group in your Facebook search engine. Uh, of course, we're also on Twitter. We're on Instagram. Uh, you'll find us just about everywhere. And of course, we've got our, uh, our respective websites as well. Spacenutspodcast.com is the official site and all the links to our social media are on there if you would like to um, take advantage of those opportunities and get to know each other. Now, Fred, let's move on to our next topic, and that is the truth about our sister planet, Venus. They call it the sister planet because it's a rocky planet and it's about the same size as Earth, but I think that's where yeah. the difference stops or the, the similarities stop. Uh, the differences are stark. Indeed, they are. Surface temperature, 450 degrees Celsius, uh, thick sun-obscuring clouds with, um, which are laced with sulfuric acid. Uh, it's, you know, it is, uh, it's incredibly different. The uh, surface pressure, atmospheric pressure, is about 100 times what it is here on Earth. So you'd be flattened. Uh, if you were standing on the surface, you'd be very, very squashed. Um, so Except in science fiction. You can go yes, there and find right. right. Science fiction is good stuff. Uh, and it, is, it beats science fiction in, in many ways. It's just impossible to imagine what it would be like. That the, the rocks themselves are probably glowing a dull red because they're so hot. So... Um, mm. Let me give you a quote uh, from uh, Dr. Suzanne Smrika, uh, who is at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in California. She says, Venus is like this cosmic gift of an accident. You have these two planetary bodies, Earth and Venus, that started out nearly the same, but have gone down two completely different evolutionary paths, but we don't know why. Uh, and that is the, you know, that's the kind of um, setting the scene for a space probe, which uh, is has currently been, uh, it, it's under consideration. It's still at an early stage in its uh, evolution in itself. Uh, this space probe is being considered for, for selection under NASA's Discovery Program. And, and actually, it would be JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, that would be the, 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 the managing organization, as they are for nearly all these inter, interplanetary probes. So what is this spacecraft called? Uh, it, it, it has a, it's a rather nice acronym, actually. Um, it's the, it's uh, Veritas 
is the name, and uh, and I've lost what it stands for. <laughs> but you can look. Take my well, word for uh, it. The V is Venus. <laughs> no, uh, Venus. Emissivity, radio science, INSAR, topography, and spectro- spect- spectroscopy. That's right. Uh, you've got it. Uh, so what it, this is a whole list of things that it will teach us. Venus, emissivity, radio science, INSAR, I'm not sure what that is yet, <laughs> topography and spectroscopy. Uh, so basically it is a, a, an orbiting spacecraft um, f- to follow up on you, you know, on the on the last big mission to Venus, uh, in, certainly in terms of studying the surface of the planet, uh, that was uh, the Magellan spacecraft back in 1994. It's hard to believe it's 26 years ago when that project ended. Mm. Um, there are other spacecraft uh, in orbit around uh, Venus at the moment. Venus Express is a European one. Uh, there is a Japanese one whose name eludes me at the moment, but they've produced some marvellous uh, insights into the atmosphere of Venus, some remarkable imagery showing things like standing waves in the atmosphere and curious things like that. Um, um, this would be, I guess, something that would build on all of those. The proposal is that it will be launched in 2026. Uh, it will orbit the planet, uh, a state-of-the-art radar system. That's the big, the, the big new facet on, on this because things have moved along since 1994. Um, so you've got three dimensions. Yeah. And, and, they, and they need radar to be able to really see what's going on because uh, Venus is... Just that, that's right. The atmosphere is essentially opaque, so you've got um, you you have to have the radar to produce these detailed maps. Um, uh, there is uh, also going to be a near infrared uh, spectrometer, um, which I suspect is what Insar might be actually. Uh, a near infrared spectrometer, um, which will basically analyze you know, what what the surface itself is made of. It will give you at least some uh, good mineral, some, some good insights into the mineral makeup of the surface. But the other thing, which, um, which is what we're seeing with Juno in orbit around Jupiter, um, by, you know, by knowing the details of the spacecraft's orbit, you can essentially plot the, the gravitational field of Venus and look in more detail than we have at the moment at the internal structure of Venus because um, the gravitational field is different depending on what the structure is. So all of these, uh, all of these instruments and, and facilities will basically, we hope, give us some idea of how the planet has evolved uh, geologically, what the geological processes are that are going on at the moment. And, and as they say, from its core to its surface. So it's a you know it's a holistic look at the planet Venus. What there are lots of things we want to know. Are there is there plate tectonics on Venus? This is something that's not really uh, not really well known. So um, all of this sort of all of these questions are on the table for the Veritas mission. So I hope um, in six years' time, Andrew, uh, when my when my knee is full, fully recovered, uh, you and I might be, be talking about the launch of this spacecraft. <laughs> Indeed. Are they going to try and find out what went wrong with Venus? Like, uh, as they say, with both Earth and Venus started out pretty much the same and, and just went totally opposite directions. Yeah. Uh, we became a livable world with, uh, with water and oxygen and all the things needed to create life, and Venus went, nah, I'm going <laughs> to trash the lot. Uh, well, you know, you can all burn in hell. Uh, or Or... They just burnt too much coal to create electricity. Not that we would ever do that. Indeed, but, that's right. Um, could we learn? Could we learn anything from the demise of Venus as a potentially livable world uh, that might help yeah, of us? Of course, um, that's you know why we study these rocky planets because um, we've got two opposite extremes on either side of us: Mars and, and Venus. Um, and the more we know about them, the more we understand. Uh, the atmosphere of our own planet and the geology of our own planet. Look, it's it's a really you know the questions are really really interesting. Um, this uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has a press release on this, uh, which is headed 
uh, if I can find the, 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 the title, Veritas, Exploring the Deep Truths of Venus. And it's worth a read because it, it really sets out what the, you know, what the questions are. Um, what, what, for example, what is the delicate geodynamic balance that ultimately makes a planet habitable? Um, considering the discovery of thousands of exoplanets orbiting the star, orbiting stars other than our sun, the answer could inform our understanding of their nature. Um, and the um, the scientist uh, Dr. Smreka that I mentioned earlier, she's quoted again as saying, "To unwrap the mysteries of Venus, we have to look under the hood of Venus's interior. I guess we'd call it the bonnet. Um, it is the engine for global." Uh, geologic and atmospheric evolution. Are Venus and the Earth fundamentally unique worlds, or are the differences between these twins only cosmetic? Don't seem very cosmetic to me. Uh, answering, this question, <laughs> answering this question is key to understanding what makes other rocky planets habitable and ultimately emerge with life. So it all feeds into that discussion of the origin of life and whether we might find life elsewhere. Mm. Fascinating. All right, we don't have to wait a heck of a long time for that one. Yep. 2026, well, it is a little while away, but uh, a lot of us will um, certainly be watching that one with interest. This is the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Hello again to our patrons, uh, whether it's through patreon.com or Supercast. Thank you for supporting Space Nuts with uh, you know as little as a few dollars a month. Uh, there are uh, several options for packages, uh, particularly through Supercast, if you want to uh, support the podcast and um, and put a few dollars into the kitty to keep us rolling along. Uh, and, of course, you get bonus material, and we did put some bonus material up for our patrons last week. So check that out if you haven't already. But uh, you'll find uh, patreon.com slash space nuts or just do a search on Supercast for space nuts. I think the links are on our website anyway, space nuts podcast.com. Uh, you can also um, support us through uh, through that website. There's a there's an Acast um, button there where you can um, certainly um, put in a, a few dollars here or there. As I've always said, not mandatory. We're not telling you to do this. It is completely optional. You do not have to. But uh, if it's something you feel like doing, if you'd like to, that's great too, and we really appreciate it. Now, Fred, uh, let's get into some questions. We've got two audience uh, questions this week. Let's uh, get into the first one. Hi, guys. I love your podcast. You're definitely my favourite. I love the banter and all the uh, really good information you give us. So thanks. My question is, um, looking around on this planet, there are an awful lot of chemical compounds of fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, etc. If you think even in the air, you know, nitrogen molecules, oxygen molecules, calcium fluorides, iron oxides, although maybe that's a um, distraction. The question is, at what stage did those chemical elements, uh, atoms, come together? And I guess most of the, all the reactions produce heat. Where did the heat go? Is it significant in the formation of a planet? Or did it happen in clouds around stars or when? Uh, it, I'm just rather intrigued to know. I'd be very interested in your answer. Many cheers and thanks again. Okay. Uh, now, we don't know who that was. Uh, didn't give a name, but uh, we appreciate the question. And, um, yeah, it's an interesting one about the uh, the uh, chemical elements. Where did they come from? Where, what, at what point did it all happen? Uh, uh, we, we sort of we know about these things, and we're still discovering new elements. But uh, yeah, what was um, what was the cause and effect? When, yeah, so it, 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 it is a great question, and the, there are kind of two parts to it because I think um, we're talking not only about the elements themselves, but about the the compounds that um, that are created when when elements join together chemically. So. Um, so we can cover them both fairly briefly, I think. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, even though, well, it's such a simple quite question, a Fred. Really. Story. So when the when the universe was <laughs> when the universe was formed uh, in the aftermath of the Big Bang, essentially the only chemical elements were hydrogen, which was about seventy five percent, helium, 
which was about most of the rest of the, uh, you know, the other 25%, r- very roughly speaking, with a few, just a few uh, uh, other light elements like lithium, and I think beryllium is one as well, uh, deuterium. So these, and, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why we are so convinced that the hot Big Bang theory is correct, because when you when you uh, go through the, the theory, you get these elements being produced in certain proportions. And that's exactly what we find when we look deep into space at the makeup of the, uh, of the, of the chemistry of the universe. So you start off with mostly hydrogen. And of course, hydrogen is the raw material of stars. The uh, hydrogen clouds collapse. Uh, and as they collapse under their own gravity, they, the, the, the pressure and temperature increase. Temperature eventually goes up high enough that you trigger nuclear fusion. And that's the key to the origin of the other chemical elements, because it's the uh, processes taking place in the interiors of stars that generate uh, the other elements. And um, you, normal stars generate uh, elements up to the excuse me, atomic weight of iron, I think that's right. Um, But beyond that, with the heavier elements, silver, gold, and, you know, uranium, maybe uh, platinum, all these heavier elements, you need need a supernova explosion. You need much higher temperatures. But the fact is that it's stars that make the chemical elements, and stars at the end of their lives either blow themselves up or shed their outer envelopes into space gradually, which our sun will do in a few billion years' time. So what they do is they enrich what we call the interstellar medium, the medium between the stars. They enrich that with uh, the basic building blocks of chemistry. And it's then that the processes start that create the compounds because many um, compounds are actually... Uh, created by chemical reactions effectively taking place in the depths of space as as atoms come together uh, to form molecules. Now, you need... It's interesting that um, the, the questioner, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know his name, uh, but it's interesting that he mentions the heat, um, that the, the, the heat produced by those reactions is probably relatively small because they are taking place in very, very rarefied gases. You know, there's hardly anything there, but there's enough that these atoms come together and like each other and bond in the in a chemical way. Um, that sort of chemistry, the formation of these molecules, does take place at very low temperatures. Uh, and it's why, um, why we, we, when we look at most stars, we find only evidence of uh, the chemical elements themselves. A few cool stars have got molecules in their atmosphere as well. Um, titanium oxide is one uh, very familiar one in, in certain types of cool stars. So uh, the, the chemistry um, takes place not so much in the stars, but more in the, in the, the, the depths of space. And then, of course, those... Uh, molecules themselves find them find themselves in uh, the, the the pre-stellar clouds of gas and dust that form the next generation of stars so uh, some of the compounds on the earth will have come from space probably and we now recognize the more we study things like comets uh, the more complex molecules we find and in particular we find a lot of c- complex um, carbon uh, based molecules organic molecules so chemistry is kind of going on in in space all the time of course it also takes place once you've formed a planet like the earth the chemistry is taking place here on earth as well um, so it's you can't sort of just pin down and say yes there was this epoch of molecule formation it's a it's an ongoing process it happens it's been happening for a long time and will continue to do so um, there's a whole science of astrochemistry andrew um, which i might encourage the, mm. the listener to go and check out astrochemistry is basically the, the the chemical you know chemical reactions of the stars some of my Close friends and colleagues from my early days went on to have significant careers in astrochemistry. And of course, it all feeds directly into astrobiology um, because you've got these often these pre prebiotic chemicals that we need for life. So very interesting topic. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Not, nice to get something uh, from yeah. you know, left field that, uh, that we 
don't normally talk about. So uh, great question. And, uh, yeah, I suppose the answer is it didn't happen at a certain time. It's just been an ongoing yep. cosmic Thanks. process. Mm. All right. Thanks for the question. Let's move on. Uh, this is uh, Simon. Simon comes from um, the area where I grew up. Hi, guys. Simon from Newcastle here. Uh, thanks for the podcast. My question is, uh, I understand there are a lot of technical issues with interferometry. Uh, however, if these could be overcome, what could we resolve from a baseline between L4 and L5 Lagrange points? Uh, thanks for the podcast once again. Mm, Simon, sounds yeah, like it's a great stuff. question. Um, so let, let's... Um, First of all, just talk about the L4 and L5 Lagrange points. Uh, you and I have spoken about Lagrange points many times, Andrew. They're the, they're the gravitational null points. Um, uh, in, in the case that Simon's talking about here, uh, uh, they're the gravitational null points where the sun's gravity and the Earth's gravity balance out effectively. And there are five of them. Uh, there's one in between the sun and the earth, which is kind of the, the most intuitively obvious one where you, you get to a point where the sun's gravity balances the earth's gravity. But then you've got to remember that this whole thing is rotating. So there are, there are four more. Um, two of them are uh, also in a straight line, uh, the sun-earth line. One's beyond the, one's beyond the earth uh, and the other is on the other side of the sun from the earth. But then the L4 and L5 points are 60 degrees ahead of and 60 degrees behind the Earth in its orbit. So you've got this, um, you know, these two points which are within the Earth's orbit, rotating with the Earth, they're gravitationally null points, so you could put a spacecraft there, that's the point of, of what Simon's saying, um, but they rotate with the Earth in its orbit, 60 degrees ahead and 60 degrees behind. So they are a long way apart, uh, many millions many tens of millions of kilometres apart. Okay, so the other side of this question is interferometry, uh, and that's a technique that's always been close to my heart. I spent a, I wasted many, many months when I was a student trying to build a, a, a new type of interferometer uh, that had never been done before. I don't think anybody had done it before, and I don't think they've ever done it since. And it did actually work. Uh, what are you doing with interferometry? You, you're making use of the wave nature. In my case, it was the wave nature of light, but you can also do it with radio waves um, so that you, you can bring two light beams together. And under certain circumstances, when you add them together, they don't just get brighter because what happens is that the, the waves of light can actually cancel each other out. So you can, it's a paradox, you can bring two beams of light together and get darkness, um, because the, 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 the waves uh, are exactly cancelling, a little bit like we do with noise cancelling headphones in, in, the, in the sound field. So, um, but you can learn a lot from that. And in fact, it was in the 1920s and 30s, I think, that... Um, uh, um, uh, scientists actually put um, interferometers onto big telescopes. What you need to do is uh, separate your, uh, the, the, the collecting, if I can put the collecting um, elements of your optical system, if it's, if it's optics, uh, separate them by as far as you can and then bring the, the light beams together separately. So one way of doing it, for example, Andrew, just to simplify, it is if you mm. imagine a, a normal telescope, a normal big astronomical telescope, and you, you cover its mirror up instead of having a 3.9 meter diameter mirror, for example, like we've got at the Anglo Australian Telescope, you cover it up and just put two holes in it at, at either side of the uh, uh, of, a, of a diameter. Uh, and then you, what you can do is the image you form, you can bring these light waves together uh, in such a way that they will interfere. That's hence the, the name of interferometry. And you can measure very fine angles with that technique. Uh, and in fact, these days, it tends to be done, certainly in the optical regime, it tends to be done, uh, and radio as well, in fact, it tends to be done not just by having two, uh, two sources, you, you have many, you have an array. And of course, that's why we have radio telescope arrays. So you, you're building a, a, a multi-baseline interferometer. Uh, the techniques used in optical astronomy, uh, particularly successfully at the Very Large Telescope in, uh, in Chile, because the four 
eight meter telescopes of the VLT uh, can be connected together along with four more smaller telescopes to form an interferometer. And that's how we uh, have been measuring the uh, essentially the um, uh, movement of stars around the galactic center. It's how we know there is a black hole at the center of our galaxy, it comes from interferometry, uh, actually also done at the Keck Observatory, but at the VLT as well. Now, I think Simon's question uh, uh, is really aimed at the radio field. And of course, that's why uh, we have radio arrays, the square kilometre array that I'm very closely connected with um, being built in Western Australia and South Africa. That is effectively an interferometer, but a very complex one because it doesn't just have two, mm. two collecting elements. It's got 136,000. And you, you kind of, each one of these plays into build, being able to build a high resolution picture. Um, what I guess uh, the technique that Simon is thinking of, the heading it comes under is something called VLBI, Very Long Baseline Interferometry, and it's a radio astronomy technique. Um, and the, the, there have been ideas for doing space VLBI. Uh, in other words, you put VLBI satellites into space to give you greatly extended baselines. Um, there, there's um, one particular system uh, that we have. I think this is a historical one. Um, um, uh, yes, I can't remember what na what nationality uh, put this into orbit, but this was a 10 meter radio telescope uh, in orbit, making interferometric ob observations until January 2019. Uh, this is in orbit around the Earth, so it reached a resolution of eight micro arc seconds. One arc second is a three, one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. A micro arc second is a millionth of that, and this could do eight of them. Uh, so you will be talking if you could do it, and I'm not sure whether it's feasible at all. But if you could do it over the length separating the two L five, uh, L four, and L five Lagrange points, you would have. You know, you'd be looking at pico arc seconds or, or smaller resolution, very, very fine detail. Uh, but that, mm. the trouble with this sort of thing is that it's all based on the economics of it, and that will be a very expensive mission, and it's not one that I've actually seen pr pr uh, proposed. So there must be some really serious difficulties with it. Whereas on the other hand, the arrays that we're seeing, like the Square Kilometre Array and ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, uh, those arrays are working very successfully and managing to overcome the difficulties of combining these beams of, of, of radio waves, because I think that would be the problem with um, such a long baseline. Uh, in, and I think also in the, in the optical field, Yes, eight micro arc seconds is easily achievable with the uh, the, the, the VLBI. Sorry, the uh, the VLTI, very large telescope interferometer at uh, Paranal. That's a slightly waffly answer to a direct question, which I didn't answer. I don't know what the resolution would be between the two Lagrange points. I could probably sit down and work it out. Actually, the answer depends. It depends entirely on what wavelength you're looking at. Uh, but um, it's. Uh, I think it is an interesting idea. I suspect there are technical difficulties that are at the moment considered insurmountable. So that's probably the bottom line. Okay. Might... There you go, Simon. He, he, he spoke without taking a breath for <laughs> probably 15 minutes answering your question when the answer could have simply been... It depends, it depends. yeah. It is. That's exactly the answer. It depends. Now, you said there were six Lagrange Five. points? Five. Well, I think there are six. Oh, are there? I, I just found. I just found one here. It's uh, a song by ZZ Top called "The Great." Oh, good. That's good. Uh, well, we better play it then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shall yeah, I indulge? Why not? Shot. Let's. There it is. I'm not allowed to play too much, otherwise there's copyright oh, issues. Rumors Wait till it gets to the punchline. Yeah. There you go. There it is. ZZ Top the Great. Yeah. Uh, they they um they do well balancing their guitars and their beards, <laughs> by the way. It's um, incredible. 
Um, thank you, Simon, for your question. Hopefully we answered that in true and traditional Space Nuts right. form. By not answering it. <laughs> <laughs> at all um no very good and and thank you for the audio questions we've had uh, quite a few this week which is great we couldn't get to all of them but we might uh, revisit the others that have turned up uh, in the next uh, episode or two but if you would like to send us an audio question go to our website spacenutspodcast.com and then click on the ama tab and there's a recording button there. And it's a really simple process. If you've got a microphone in your device, whether it's a smart device or a laptop or a desktop computer, as long as it's got a microphone that you can easily get to, I mean, there's no point having a microphone in the tower down next to your ankle. But, um, yeah, uh, just all you have to do is press start recording and say, hi, I'm Fred, I'm from Sydney, and I want to know um, all the secrets of the universe. And Fred will be able to answer <laughs> the <other> it. Fred. <laughs> yeah, the other Fred, maybe. Yeah, that's it. that's how it uh, goes. So, spacenutspodcast.com. dot com. While you're there, check out the shop. We've got a space nuts shop. There's a, a book tab there as well, and um, uh, Astronomy Daily. You can check out stories there. Uh, we've got the, the website coming together nicely. Still a work in progress, but it's uh, it's well on its way. That's it for another week, Fred. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Sorry about Mandu, and hopefully the knee will stop hurting in 18 to yes. 20 months and uh, everything can get back. Yeah, to that'll be good. Uh, we're, we're doing all right, thanks. And um, thank you for your, again for your condolences, Andrew. It's, uh, uh, it's nice to, to remember Mandu. And, um, he, he was such a big part of, of Space Nuts. So end of an year. He was, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. All right. Thoughts are with you and, and Marnie. And uh, we will catch you again next week on uh, another episode. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, joining us every week here on the Space Nuts podcast. Looking forward to your company next time, episode 212 coming up. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, farewell. See you real soon. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.